Good morning. Welcome back to the international webinar organized by the Department of English in collaboration with IPSC. You know the topic of this webinar is cartographies of belongingness, unbelongingness from roots to roots. We are on the second day of this two-day international webinar. This is the third plenary session. And it's a great honor and privilege that today we have with us renowned professor Dr. Pritesh Chakraborty. He will deliver his enlightening lecture on displacement, distress, and dystopia, representation in river of stories and other sequential narratives. Before his talk, I would like to introduce him to the audience. Dr. Pritesh Chakraborty is an assistant professor of English at a college named Acharya Shukumar Sen Mahavidyalaya, West Bengal, India. He is a former Fulbright foreign language teaching assistant in New York University. He has been awarded PhD from West Bengal State University. He has obtained MPhil degree from Calcutta University. Now he is researching on superhero comic books of Batman. He is also interested in creative writing. He has published academic articles in scholarly journals and have attended quite a number of seminars and conferences both international and national. So now over to you, sir. The platform is of yours. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for uh, this uh, almost uh, unreal uh, introduction. I am not renowned, uh, but uh, I'll try my best to uh, present uh, my views on uh, the present international seminar. And it's an honor and a privilege to be uh, presenting uh, in front of you uh, in this platform. So I would request uh, whoever is uh, handling the PowerPoint presentation to bring it on the screen so that I can begin the um, presentation. It's coming up. OK. Uh, can we have it in uh, full screen? Yeah. I mean, it's still, uh, yeah, right. OK, great. So. Um, the the topic of my presentation is uh, displacement distress and dystopia representations in river of stories and other uh, sequential narratives and i take this uh, opportunity to thank uh, uluberia college for organizing this international seminar on this uh, very timely uh, topic of uh, uh, uncartographies and unbelongingness um, so my uh, take uh, on this idea, on, on this topic, uh, will be presented via sequential narratives, which is a fancy name for uh, comic books. Uh, my main focus would be uh, River of Stories uh, by Urijit Shen, but there will be other uh, comics and uh, graphic narratives, uh, which will uh, also portray uh, how displacements uh, leads to distress and how distresses uh, eventually end up in uh, dystopias of uh, various sorts. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so the first question that I would like to answer on my own, preemptively, even if nobody uh, has questioned my choice, uh, I would like to uh, ask myself, or I would like to ask all of you, who is, whoever is listening to this, that why comics or graphic narratives? Why comics and graphic, sorry, why comics and graphic narratives could be useful medium, could be a useful medium for conveying displacement and distress? Well, uh, in order to answer these uh, uh, questions, I have uh, pointed out a, a few of the uh, of the ideas as to why I chose uh, the, the the graphic uh, novel format uh, to present these. Um, ideas so i mean uh, if you can see this uh, this this page if you can see this uh, slide there you can see there are like four different uh, speech bubbles uh, wh which contain which contain some written uh, material and we are not sure which one should we take up uh, first this gives us uh, a hint to the formalistic destabilized unstable, liminal, and ambiguous space in which graphic narratives themselves function. So the very format of graphic 
novel the very format of comics according to me is conducive for the representation of these kinds of displacements these kinds of uh, 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 unbelongingness because if you read a little about uh, comics you would understand that they are an amalgamation of images and words and hence they do not belong to either written traditional literature or to painting both of them are considered to be elder arts to comics if comics and graphic novels can at all qualify to be arts so my first argument is that since comics itself does not belong very surely to any academic or artistic space in our uh, collective uh, societal and cultural space i believe it does function as a as a medium as a scope as an area where the people who belong to the margins the people who do not belong anywhere or the people who have been pushed off from being belonging to anywhere can be represented i'm not saying that the comic books is uh, 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 the ideal medium or or the comic books are always about the marginalized and the distressed and the displaced but comic books can be used as a medium because of the effort said uh, already said already mentioned um, uh, formalistic detail that they can become uh, a, a place uh, a, 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 they have a scope for the representation of these people uh, uh, who are displaced uh in a in 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 uh in our everyday uh society so the first uh thing that uh, the, the second thing rather uh, that i would like to say uh, as to why i chose this medium other than doing my own research on comic books why i uh, chose uh this uh format is because and this is a common adage now uh, pictures speak a thousand words so one image will represent a number of uh, things uh, one image can be used to uh, mean so many things uh, from the perspective of the displaced and from the perspective of the marginalized people who are made to belong uh, to nowhere the second is uh, the images and colors uh, are processed faster as opposed to traditional literature now there has been some research into this uh, argument that uh, it's it, uh, our our faculties of uh, viewing our faculties of seeing something works faster and works faster when they are colored um as opposed to traditional literature and hence if you remember the fiasco that uh, took place once uh, is that um, there was this uh, gory representation of a uh, uh, cancer affected um uh, uh mouth or an organ uh, which was imprinted on the uh, uh cigarette cases the 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 cigarette manufacturing companies were up against this kind of representation on their packets because they knew that this picture will be processed faster this picture will leave an indelible impression on the people who are going to buy it or that was the idea because i don't think uh, even this image has stopped uh, people from uh, smoking not sure about that next is it is a, i already said i already talked about this issue that an unstable medium harbors uh, in uh, instabilities and then uh, the comic books since uh, or the graphic novels since they are not considered to be traditional serious literature they can often go under the radar of the authorities uh, of the scrutinizing authorities and they can say almost anything we can and we will uh, try to see if this is true in the case of uh, the comic books or the images uh, from the graphic novels that i am going to 
or i'm going to uh, present here now uh, taking uh, the the cue uh, from uh, yesterday's uh, presentation yesterday's uh, fantastic uh, speech by dr mukherjee uh, she said something very important that uh, uh, though the margins were considered to be the places where things end they can also be considered to be places where things begin and comic books if you if you have a closer look at the comic books and the pages in the graphic novels they many of them have these kinds of panels have these kinds of borders and uh, uh, somewhere between these two panels somewhere between these two borders and i'm emphasizing the word borders because it will be uh, useful later on it is in it is between these two spaces it is, it is between these two images that some stories develop or some stories originate and we will talk about it uh, in detail uh, from our uh, next slide uh, onwards so can we please go to the next slide okay now this image uh, has been uh, taken from uh, river of stories by urijit shen and this image uh talks about how under the duress of uh environmental uh, uh issues under the duress of uh, progress so called progress under the duress of urban progress traditional tribal marginalized spaces got um swamped got uh taken away they were taken away the, the the spaces were taken away by the mainstream urban uh, progressive so called uh, progressive uh, powers in this uh, picture in this image uh, we can see there is this uh, uh, sahib there is this uh, officer also known as sahib uh he complains that uh, these tribals whoever is represented by the tribals these tribals choose the most unhospitable inhospitable terrain to make their settlements as if they chose that to be which is far from the case it is the so called urban progressive uh, uh, mainstream culture that pushes these people to these inhospitable terrains and yet even within these inhospitable terrains the, the the authorities the mainstream urban authorities uh, try to uh, make inroads in the name of uh, industrialization in the name of uh, national uh, progress and they try to misappropriate the places the spaces in which these uh, marginal people had been living and eking their livelihood out uh, their their livelihood out now he is uh, here this this person this officer is uh, here uh, to make roads to make uh, uh, dams to make um, uh, factories and to make settlements uh, clearing the forests on which the tribal people depend on and the reason why i have not particularized any particular location i have i have not mentioned the the location in which uh these people are uh, going to for the very reason that this could be a very general statement uh this is a comic book panel this is a creative representation of what happens when uh urban uh, progressive uh, uh people mainstream people try to make inroads into the lands into the already marginalized uh, spaces of the of the tribal of of the non mainstream uh, people and if we uh, take into example uh, say nondigram or shingur uh, though these nondigram and shingur are both not too far away from uh, our traditional civilization but uh, there was a lot of um, political hula balu governments changed over this inroads of inroads that were being made in the name of uh, progress and now um uh, whatever is wrong with shingur is the result of a half baked half hearted 
uh, attempt to industrialize a, a wholly agricultural space now that space neither belongs to the traditional agricultural endeavor and well industrialization is a failed uh, attempt over there this image where the where the jeep uh, ridden by these two people complaining that they are uh, going to some place which is very inhospitable because the tribals were living in in inhospitable regions and it is now the brown man's burden and i'm and i'm using the pun uh, from the white man's burden the the brown man the sahib the the native sahib the complicit bourgeois is helping the often indian or often indigenous or foreign uh, uh, industrial forces to capture these virgin lands to capture these lands where the the tribal uh, people have been living and uh, have been living peacefully away from uh, the capitalist din of our uh, of our economy and uh, culture it is these places which according to the brown sahib needs an upliftment and as the europeans had come to uh, the 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 asian and the latin american countries saying oh uh, these uh, brown people are uncivilized these black people are uncivilized and we have the burden to make them civilized we will give them industry we will give them education we will give them uh, pakka houses to live in the same rhetoric is being parroted by the the people who have inherited the colonial discourse and dialogue from our erstwhile colonial masters and are renegotiating are reimplementing the same uh, perspectives onto uh, our own lands onto our own forests and rivers and uh, other places uh, which were otherwise environmentally balanced but due to the so called uh, rhetoric the so called discourse of uh, of of progress even these places are now uh, uh, in in a kind of a unstable uh, situation leading uh, 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 to their to their ultimate uh, destruction leading to the destruction of the lifestyle to the, uh, leading to the destruction of the culture of of the people involved uh, people living in these uh, spaces can we go to the next slide please okay now uh, if this is a long read i mean this is a text heavy uh, uh, passage uh, this is a text heavy image that i have adopted uh, from the same uh, comic book and i was talking about uh, these um, white borders there are four separate images and there are like these white spaces between uh, these uh, these images and in the language of uh, comics or in the language of sequential narratives they are known as gutters um they are known as panel borders also so uh, if we see it from the stylistic point of view we might make a parallel we might compare these four separate images as displaced semioitic spaces within another semioitic space that is the page in a in, in traditional literature we will have these uh, paragraphs and we will have these lines that have been um, um arranged uh, from top to bottom from uh, right to left well we are going to read uh, the the pages from right to left from top to bottom that's uh, a given but uh, according to another research uh, the first image that we usually look at uh, in a page especially if it's a visual page is usually the top right corner um while i was studying uh, a little bit of journalism in my undergraduate days i was made aware of this kind of a uh, of a of a hand eye uh, coordinating uh, fact that the first image that we look at the first thing that we look at is usually the top right corner of uh, a particular uh, page 
I don't, I'm not sure if it happens all the time, but it does happen uh, now when I say it uh, so clearly that the first image that we might encounter is not the one that is on the left, but that is the one that is on the top right corner. We can find the people uh, engaged in, in, um, in their uh, agricultural activities, in their cultivational activities, while the speech bubbles, while the speech or the narration is coming from a bus uh, that is not, that does not belong to that particular uh, place. Even when a sympathetic reporter or even when a sympathetic uh, activist is working for the development or working uh, towards a resistance developed by these tribal and uh, by these land losing uh, people, even then this is a kind of a description of their livelihood from beyond, from beyond their own uh, spaces of talking back. They are not saying anything. They are mute. They, ha they are initially described by the sahib in the, uh, in the jeep as uh, uncivilized, <clears throat> uneducated, uh, um, uncultured people, even when there is a sympathetic voice, this sympathetic voice does not emanate from within, but from outside, from an, a social activist who lays bare the mechanics of the internal colonization that goes on in the name of progressive development in, in various areas, in various developing countries, and particularly in India, and how these people, in, in the name of being brought to the folds of development, have to abandon their established way of life. Uh, one of the people uh, who stands for development says uh, they don't have schools in the tribal uh, areas. They don't have colleges, they don't have universities in the tribal areas, they don't have metal roads in the tribal areas, they don't have railways, they don't have industry, they don't have internet. I mean, when Orijit Shen was writing, it was, or drawing, internet was not really a big issue, but today it is. My question to them, or my question to myself, or this progressive discourse is, why do they need schools? Why do they need colleges and universities? Why do they need metal roads? Why the hell do they need internet for? This is a manufactured want by the consumerist and capitalist world of ours. And it is being projected as a need amongst the tribal populations, among the marginalized population. Exactly as uh, the Britishers had come to us and said, oh, you need Jesus. Uh, you need uh, uh, to wear trousers. You need a hat. You need, um, uh, you need gunpowder. You need uh, government. Similarly, we are replicating. We are mimicking. If we follow uh, Homi Baba's uh, mimicking, uh, the idea of mimicking, we are mimicking whatever had been handed down to us by the uh, the the Britishers, by 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 the European uh, discourse of uh, progress, and the fact that these voices are coming from a panel of a graphic novel, which is again another fancy name of comic books, and we can debate on that is very vital okay now can we come to the next slide okay it's not that there is no resistance it's not that i said that the the people in the panels the people in the marginalized spaces are mute but not that's not always the case they can have resistance as we can find a a, a voice of resistance in this uh, particular image and there is this reporter who is uh, taking a picture of the gathering of the people who do not want to uh, 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 who do not want the Narmada Dam 
to be built where it was uh, going to be built uh, which would submerge the entire area which uh, housed like 10000 or uh, more people and they say we oppose all those who in the name of development commit crimes against humanity by tearing apart this earth for their own short term gains nothing could be more plain nothing could be more uh, simple in terms of resistance it sums up the the voice of of river of stories it sums up the voice of the people who are all for resisting any attempt for any short term development goals which jeopardizes environment which jeopardizes livelihoods which jeopardizes the culture of the indigenous people now uh, can we come to the next slide okay um now i am uh, coming to a more uh, comic book uh, ish uh, ideas and bear with me uh, this is more colorful uh, but the i i don't know if if you can read uh, uh, hindi uh, i will translate uh, the hindi uh, for uh, you people but you can have a look at the images as i said uh, pictures uh, speak a thousand words and while i jabber on you can have a closer look at these uh, images the first image the first panel shows there has been some kind of a a um, a uh, 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 larceny some kind of a a a a colony uh, um, a basti set fire and there is a fire tender and there are police personnel who are trying to uh, put the fire out we have seen these kinds of fires breaking out right in kolkata so many times where the bastis where the colonies often uh, are given to fire short circuit political greed you name it it happens and this is a comic bookish representation of that kind of a greed that leads to the displacement of the people living in those marginal spaces even from those marginal spaces the people are forced by fire this time to 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 go away to to leave their land and go somewhere else where they are as unwelcome as they were in the place initially the people are taken taken uh, in to the hospitals people are being taken away in stretchers and then of course there is resistance there is uh, uh, a sloganeering there is um, people who are out on the streets uh, asking for justice to be done and then there is this uh, person in the fifth panel if you count from the top uh, in the in the in the left side of the of the page there is an image where a a a a a person wearing white it might remind you of politicians who often wear a lot of white this person says that he will give money to the displaced he becomes a masiha he becomes a person who talks about helping the people out and the people are very happy because these poor people uh, are happy with the little dole that they have been provided by this person and at the final panel you can i mean i'll leave it to you to understand why was this person interested in giving money to the poor people who lost their uh, houses to the fire initiated perhaps by the same person who is providing them money and then he is doing this he is developing the land for uh, his five star hotels or his uh, housing complex you can make the connection on your own now can we come to the next slide again okay now i need to tell you something about the background of this uh, image on the very first panel and you can see how uh, unstable these panels are they are not really very um uh defined they are not really very shaped uh, rectangularish or squareish and uh, i would begin from the left here is this superhero called nagraj he is an indian uh, superhero and he speaks hindi and this comic book is composed in hindi 
and uh, this person is uh, is observing that his fellow uh, snake people he's a snake person he's a snake man uh, if you can understand his green skin and his uh, the white um uh, marks that are there on his chest that seems to mean that he is a kind of a, a hybrid as all comics are uh, between words and pictures between words and images this person is a hybrid between um a snake and a man he is observing that other snake men like him have taken in a lot of opium they these people are opium addicted and even if these people these snake people these half snake half men people are um capable of uh, helping this superhero by enlisting in his army which uh, he uses to fight evil instead of doing that instead of doing something creative instead of doing something progressive what are these people doing these people are uh, taking opium taking these kinds of uh, uh, addictive substances and they are lying inert as if they are those lotus eaters in the in the lotus eater uh, poem by um, uh, tennyson ulysses like nagraj decides that enough is enough he takes it upon himself to make these people work for him to make their lives worthwhile and he argues with the leader of uh, their community and asks him to listen to him asks him to uh, 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 stop these kinds of um, uh, drug abuse uh, substance abuse and enlist themselves in his army in uh, and he asks uh, them to fight along uh, him in uh, to to defeat evil whatever evil uh, he fights the leader of these people who are lying uh, inert uh, under the influence of uh, opium disagrees and he says that uh, he he likes the way things are he is he he does not care uh, to fight against uh, any greater cause than to uh, than to just uh, take uh, drugs and uh, uh, live their life as they please nagraj is not too happy with this next slide please even if you cannot read the 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 text in hindi you can read the determination on the face of this particular uh, uh, superhero he says okay i will make sure that these people work for me i'll make sure that you leave your livelihood of indolence and join me in my fight against evil i will make sure that you do not waste your time taking opium and other uh, other drugs and and just lay around not doing anything because you are people and you are supposed to use your life for some good do you find a kind of a repetition of what that brown sahib uh, was saying uh, about the tribal people isn't it something that has been fed to us by saying that uh, the tribal people are not educated the tribal people are not um are not uh, civilized their way of life is uh, backwards and our way of life is the real way of life and we should uh, teach them and we should show them the path towards a uh, uh, a glory towards a better life even if they we, we don't care to ask if they want it or not nagraj does the same the superhero does the same he does not ask them whether they want a life of uh, of of action or whether they want a a life of indolence and then he does something very uh, radical next slide please okay fire he sets fire to the crop of the opium that they had cultivated and that they were uh, having does by destroying their crop does by destroying their way of life he is trying to force these people to come to the fold of progressive development the the fire that we saw uh, a few pages a few images earlier 
were set on to the colonies of the poor people uh, to the to the shanties of the poor people and now this person comes up and sets fire to the to the the opm fields to the opm cultivation forcing these people to change the way they were living to doing something progressive into doing something uh, fruitful uh, according to his own uh, discourse let's come to the next slide okay now displacement uh, can occur not just due to uh, political greed not just due to uh, uh, environmental issues but displacement can happen also because of war and the greatest of all displacements happened during the second world war while hitler was carrying out his pogrom against the jews this image is taken from uh, the pulitzer award winning uh, graphic novel named uh, mouse a survivor still by uh, art spiegelman and this image shows an order that has been issued against the jews that they will be removed from their homes to some uh, place which is not really a concentration uh, camp right away but which is some place which is not their home they will be uh, formed into ghettos they will be pushed into ghettos and uh the next step of the pogrom would be uh, carried out it is interesting since we are talking about diaspora it is interesting that the idea of diaspora was initially associated with the mass movements of the jews in the very early uh, uh centuries even before uh, christ and just as a kind of a haunting image this image tells about the beginning of the the displacement of the jews uh, due to the war now even if we think that okay uh, the second world war happened a long time ago and uh, it's it's done it's it's over with we have to think again because we are now seeing so many wars going on in syria in uh, azerbaijan armenia and people are getting displaced all the time and they are ghettoized they are victimized they are uh, stigmatized they are made in, they, they are made into marginal people all the time and the model was this the model the most successful model was the the holocaust model and we come to the next slide again this is the process in which the people were carried from one particular place into auschwitz and uh, they were of course gassed uh, shot stabbed clubbed uh, uh, made made to uh, made to uh, dig their own holes and uh, fall into them they were engraved by their own uh, uh, people this perhaps is 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 the most stark form of displacement because in this displacement people are not just displaced from one space to another but they are rather displaced from life into death altogether next slide now this image has been uh, taken uh, from joe sacco's uh, uh, footnotes in gaza this image this comic book this uh, graphic novel also talks about the turning of the table actually now when we were sympathizing with the uh, with the jews with the people of jewish descent that uh, hitler had done so much wrong to them joe sacco points out that uh, in this case uh, these this the, the people in israel the people who have been displaced and have come into israel are doing the same thing to the palestinians next slide this is the gaza strip and gradually the entire little place of about 12 kilometers in width and maybe 20 kilometers 25 kilometers in in length is gradually being appropriated by the forces of israel right from say 1940s till date there is still trouble over that little strip of land 
where the people are uh, strategically where the people are gradually forced away from their homes and the same thing is being repeated uh, say with uh, was repeated with the kashmiri pandits uh, rohingyas uh, you name it the people are still getting uh, uh, displaced by this war effort by one political by one military power or another next slide please now this is what is a this is what a dystopia looks like a place where you do not have water where you do not have uh, sanitation where you do not have anything where you just have a negative space where you just have distress because uh, you have you were displaced uh, from your uh, uh, native uh, lands this is the palestinians living in the gaza strip some 40 years ago and if you compare it with the camps with the refugee camps of of the rohingyas or the camps that were established uh, for the kashmiri pandits or the the camps that were established uh, after the nrc uh, procedure was done you would find the same thing is being repeated again and again and these comic books are representing them in quite a stark quite an abject uh, uh, manner like it's on your face images of of the displacement and the dystopias resulting out of them next slide another aspect of displacement Uh, is being talked about in this uh, uh, collection of uh, uh, graphic novels or collection of uh, graphic stories uh, by um, Bishwajyoti Ghosh, and this is uh, known as the um, uh, this side that side. Um, this is uh, a collection of stories uh, edited by Bishwajyoti uh, Ghosh, and this can. this includes stories about how partition has uh, displaced and uh, distressed people both uh, of 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 uh, this side and that side next slide please now this is one of the stories uh, from the anthology and this is how uh, uh, some people in pakistan some hindus in pakistan uh, were trying to escape from pakistan and they wanted to come into india and these are the various images these are the various threats that they uh, had to deal with in order to make this transition from a place that they called home to a place that might be their home but before that they have to run the gauntlet with the the barbed wires with the armed guards with desert with fog with bog with who knows what so this causes this distress this this displacement causes the distress that is being represented in these uh, images next slide please now uh, this is a graphic representation drawn by myself and hence it's so hideous uh it's uh, it's a scene taken from a a, a representation of uh, a short story called toba takes sing by sadat hasan manto here uh, toba takes sing uh, represents the displacement and its aftermaths in terms of psychological displacement he is uh, mr jarnail singh who lost his shop who, who lost his everything in the riots uh, during the partition and he has lost his mind he uh, wants to go to toba taxing which is in pakistan but since he is um, a hindu uh, sorry a sikh lunatic he must go to india i mean uh, it's it's funny that uh, when uh, when india and pakistan decided to uh, uh, divide everything they had the good sense of dividing their lunatics as well they wanted a fair share of their uh, madness uh, as well and unfortunately for jarnail singh uh he finds that toba takes sing is in uh is in pakistan and he is forced off he is packed off to india where uh, uh where he does not find his uh, place of uh, belongingness It, throughout the entire story and throughout the, uh, the the sequential narrative format that i have tried to give it uh sadat uh, hasan manto was trying to say that this is sheer madness 
uh, on, on on terms of uh, in terms of this division between uh, the places which actually displaces not only people but also their psychotopias as it happened in the case of uh, this person uh, called uh, jarnail singh i think um, that's the end of uh, my presentation uh, there is this just one slide after it which is like the thank you slide is that it uh, can you come yeah okay so that's it uh, for uh, all for today that's what i wanted to say that that was my take on the 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 topic of the day and uh, this is how i think uh, comic books this is how i think uh, sequential narratives uh, can help bring these images bring these ideas of displacement and distress and dystopia more starkly more sequentially uh, in, in 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 the consciousness of the people who are uh, reading or viewing this thank you so much uh, for being patient with me it's over to thank sir you. now thank you thank you so much for such an insightful lecture uh, and it was a it, it was really very nice and engaging session sir uh, you begin the lecture with why comics or graphic narratives are useful medium for conveying displacement distress and how comics or graphic graphic narratives uh, as an unstable medium harbors instabilities uh, we have also discussed about the appropriation of the medium for the theme where the feeling of unbelongingness identity crisis predominate in the narratives and to establish your point you have given a few examples uh, examples of graphic novels or, or comic narratives so uh, thank you thank you uh, for such uh, an insightful lecture sir uh, there are few questions uh, in the chat box i see uh, uh, taking your uh, kind permission or consent just i would uh, i would pass the questions to you yeah sure sure okay the first question is from shoikot nath there is a question from shoikot nath sorry so don't yeah, i can read the question yeah okay yes. oh, go ahead. so don't you think that in post colonial text with regard to the representation of the colonized by the colonizer there remains an ambivalence of colonial discourse um yes uh, definitely uh, see uh, what what i think what i believe is uh, and and i believe and i have uh, other philosophers other comic book studies uh, scholars uh, who believe that the entire medium the entire discourse of comic books is ambivalent it's not clear even even say even for example the 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 term comics if you type comics in 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 microsoft it will show a kind of a green uh, or a, or a purple underlining telling you that comics is not is they are but when we are referring to a single comic book we we call it comics and yet we are not sure what its corresponding verb should be so of course there is a lot of scope for ambivalence in the comic books uh, themselves and yes as you point out very correctly that uh, when uh, when the, uh, 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 the 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 colonized represent the colonizer then of course there are areas of uh, ambivalences because um the colonized as i as i keep on saying as i keep on believing that the colonized have been schooled in the same discourse that the colonizers were schooled we will not go out of the way to uh, to uh, brace our colonizers to be people who can have some goodness inside them who can have some uh, some areas of development yes of course i mean there are there is a lot of uh, place for uh, uh, ambivalent representations and that is what makes this uh, uh, medium interesting because you can always find very paradoxical very antithetical ideas working all together just like images and texts being an antithetical epistemic positions working together uh, in order to bring out significances yet ambivalent significances i hope that uh, kind of answers your uh, query 
thank you, thank you so much. There is another part of uh, of his question, of his query, that uh, he says the colonized are at once represented as weaker on one hand and uncivilized on the other at the same time. So, does it refer to the inherent ambivalence in colonial discourses? Uh, yes. Uh, see, um, that's what the problem with a lie is. You know, when you speak a lie, when you say something that is not true, uh, it changes with time. It changes with your conveniences. But uh, from your uh, sentence, uh, weak can be uncivilized and the uncivilized can be weak. There is no discrepancy in this statement. If the colonizers are saying that, yes, the colonized are weak and uncivilized, then there is no uh, no uh, no uh, uh, conflict. But what I what, what I think you're trying to say, uh, Shoikot, is that uh, is that on one hand, they are saying that uh, uh, we are uncivilized. On the other hand, they are saying that uh, 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 on, the, on the other hand, they are saying that they know that we are rich in our culture and they are saying the, the same. They are saying that we are uncivilized so that they could whitewash our civilization, our culture with their uh, way of life, with their discourses and and make us unrooted and hence easy for, for them to bottle us, uh, uh, to, to, to make us separate from our uh, sources and thus weaken us further, helping them to colonize and recolonize us time and again. So that's my answer to uh, your question. Good question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, next question from Ifsita Mitro. Uh, mm -hmm. She asked, do you think that the idea of hero for saving that we see in the marginalized mass is actually also a problem that stops them to stand on their own feet? Okay, uh, talking of ambivalences, I think I can make out two inferences from this uh, question. Uh, Ipshita, are you trying to say that um, we are the, the, the people who can speak uh, the, the seminars and the conferences and the so-called intellectual people are worshipping the marginalized? Or are you saying that the marginalized masses or the people who are marginalized worship a hero say like ambedkar or 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 uh, uh, or, or, or some other uh, uh, champion for the marginalized and hence they lose the opportunity to do things on their own hand if the latter is your query yes of course that's the problem if we give our authority if we give our voice to some other person then we lose the opportunity to say what we wanted to say. But then, uh, if everybody is trying to say something, say for example, uh, in this app, in this stream yard, uh, 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 all the participants who are listening to this seminar are not allowed to speak. Because if everybody starts speaking, then it becomes cacophony. And that is again a discourse. That represses the voice of the individual in the mass and the hero appropriates the voice and puts it in his in his or her own agenda and uh, presents it presents the voice as uh, his or her own yes if if the second inference from your question is true then this is what is happening with the masses we give our voice we give the right to speak to a particular hero, no matter who that particular hero is. And then this, this makes us unable, yes, to stand on our feet, to say what we wanted to say. But then there is a question of who has the right voice? And, and, and is it possible for a country like India, so populous, to be given opportunity for everyone to speak? I mean, that is a conundrum that we need to uh, solve. I hope okay, uh, that thank you, thank you for the explanation. Thank you for the explanation. The uh, third question from Somili Hazra. Uh, mm -hmm. Sir, I have seen some manuals before and there. 
I notice the changes of colors according to themes. When the theme is about depression, you disturbing side of reality. The colors used in it tends to be in dark colors. While on the other hand, when the theme is based on the nice side of reality, the colors are bright. So can we say that even the colors affect our unconscious mind? Yes, uh, according to me, they do. And the comic book creators know it very well. But uh, show me, can you see it from the other side as well? Can colors depress or help you uh, feel uh, brighter? And the, the reason behind the comic books, most of the comic books or graphic novels using color is because of this fact that seeing bright colors somehow makes you feel a little better on on the other hand the, the 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 dark colors the dark hues make you feel a little more uh, depressed than you uh, earlier were so yes if you say that uh, colors affect our unconscious mind yes and our and and, and in, a, in a broader sense the 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 colors that we have around us actually shape our consciousness because uh, Tying it up with the question that Shoikoth has asked earlier, uh, uh, Tintin, in, Tintin in Congo, uh, uh, the people in Congo are all painted black, pitch black. No questions asked. No, no difference in their hues. Uh, in, in, in Tintin in Tibet, uh, the Lamas are yellowish and, and Tintin and Haddock is white. So the, the colors have already formed the colonized and the marginalized discourse in the minds of the people and yes uh, it's a kind of a vicious circle that uh, that that keeps on repeating itself that if you see a dark color if you if you if if dark hues are represented in the manhua then it means depression it means darkness it means death and on the other hand bright colors would mean good uh, things great things and if you tie it up with the colonial discourse of um, trying to push uh, people out of the margin, black is evil. Uh, brown is evil. Uh, so that that figures. Thank you. Uh, the last question from uh, Shuichi Parui. Sir, as we are talking about the representation of the displaced people in graphic narrative, can we also include the story of Marji in Parsifalish, who faces displacement not only geographically, but also a cultural displacement in her own country? Definitely, yeah. I mean, I was thinking about including Persepolis, but Persepolis is an autobiography. It's about uh, a, usually a single person. And um, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, single person representing an entire culture of Iran. True, the constant wars, the kind of repressive regime that is still there in Iran leads to dis displacement. I mean, uh, the kind of oppressive regime uh, leads to displacement all the time. I mean, if you, if, you, uh, if you do not believe in a particular discourse, if you do not chant uh, Jai Shri Ram, if you do not say Allahu Akbar, you are out. You, you have to be displaced. You do not belong to a particular place or community or time or geography if you do not wear the burqa or if you do wear the burqa uh, or if you, uh, uh, if you eat a particular animal or not. So yes, of course, Persepolis's Marji, Marjan Satrapi, is definitely a displaced subject position, uh, broadly speaking, and a displaced subject particularly. Yes, that's true. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, such explanations. Uh, and th uh, thank you for the uh, insightful lecture. So now, with your permission, taking your permission, kind permissions, we would like to start the technical session. Uh, there are four presenters who will present their uh, paper. Uh, so, shall we start, sir? There yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, I, I would like to request to chair the session. There are four paper presenters. Uh, I think they are ready. Uh, I would like to request at first Dr. Prema Rucha. Uh, 
He's an, uh, he's an assistant professor in English from St. Javier's College, Goa. The title of her paper is From Roots to Roots, Displacement in the Arrival by Sean Ten. So I would like to request Dr. Prema Rucha uh, to start her presentation, to begin her presentation. So can I like uh, switch off my cam and mic? Uh, uh, yeah, okay, thank you, thank you so much. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are perfectly audible. Could someone please confirm if I am audible? May I begin? Yes, you, yes, you, you, you are audible, perfectly audible. You can start. Yes, thank you, you can sir. Start now. Thank you. Thank you. So good day, everyone. Good day, everyone. Yes, thank you. Good day, everyone. I'm Prema Rocha all the way. From. Thank you so much to the organizers for giving us this wonderful platform to connect even in these tough times. And uh, our chairperson, uh, may I begin with your permission, sir? Your paper, your presentation was a perfect uh, framework for me to fit in here. So thank you. My presentation is based on a graphic narrative that you will find very interesting because it is special by its silent eloquence. Why do I say that? So this text by Sean Tan, okay, called The Arrival, proceeds wordlessly. So it is so special because there is not a single word in this book. If you can, I have a presentation actually, but I don't know whether I, the presentation has just some visuals. So the book is very special in that it's in black and white. And uh, Dr. Pritesh Chakraborty spoke about how when things are dark, uh, it's more desolate. And where there's light, there's illumination and hope. And similarly, so this a book by Sean Tan uh, proceeds completely eloquently and silently. But it's ironic how words are all that we have. And we are so dependent on words to deal with text like this. So here goes. May I try sharing my screen? You can share. You, you can share your screen. Yes, sir. I'm just trying to do that. Yes. yes, yes. Thank you. Is it okay if I have it on the desktop? I have to just. Yes, I have it open. Um, How do I? So it's saying, will you allow StreamYard? I say, allow. Is there any chance that my screen is being shared? I think not. Okay. No problem. I think I'll just manage without. All right. So, comics and graphic novels. Sorry. Um, Ma'am, do I have to keep my? Do I have to keep my? Uh, I'd love to do that again. Do I have to keep my uh, session open on the desktop first? Yes, yes. And don't so I have my presentation open. Yes. Don't it is maximized, ma'am. Yes. Please right. Share the Chrome tab or the web browser tab where StreamYard is open. Right. Okay. Then click on so the I'm share screen. So I'm saying share screen. Yes. Then click on the application window option. I'm not getting the application window for some reason. Your browser has blocked your screen. Click the screen icon. Oh, never mind. The browser has blocked it. Okay, okay. Then we can. Should I just proceed, ma'am? So thank you. That might problem. take. Yes, yes, thank you so much. I will. Comics and graphic novels in particular, once dismissed as trite, have become ubiquitous in the arena of literary studies as an innovative and valuable narrative format. The opening of literary studies to comics and graphic novels has been regarded as a postmodern phenomenon, which has to do with the continuous hybridization of media and art forms, 
as well as the progressive dismantling of the frontiers between high and low art. The rise of the graphic novel is also linked with a corresponding lacuna in the ability of literature to cater to the larger audience who then turn to varied forms of storytelling. Some of the most celebrated graphic novelists of the present time, Art Spiegelman, Joe Sacco, have showed how these narratives can inscribe political history into their graphic representation. And Professor Chakraborty also just dealt with that. Sean Tan's work deals with social, political, and in search of opportunity and a better future for his family. He immigrates, leaving behind a homeland that seems fraught with peril and insecurity, as depicted in the page. He manages to find a space to live in the New Eden. Silently, the narrative depicts the struggle of the protagonist to come to grips with the alien tongue, find employment, a place to stay. Pirate his way across cross the unfamiliar cityscape, make friends with more established immigrants, and empathize with the challenges faced by with their own demons. The ending is a happy one, as the protagonist is united wife and child who join him in the new land, which finally becomes home. The arrival tells not an immigrant's story, but the immigrant story. It is the story of everyone's of every man's arrival, of why people leave everything behind. It is the realistic and powerful experience of being in a foreign land denied even the comfort of a foreign language. The origami bird in the text that the father gives the child while he leaves encapsulates and becomes the link between home and the new world. Migration is a defining feature of the contemporary world. It has fittingly become, in the words of Edward Said, a potent, even enriching motif of modern culture. As the exile, aware that homes are transient, cross borders and break barriers of thought and experience. To Rushdie, the prototypical transnational post-colonial, however, this is an enabling location as well. Sean Tan's own identity is a hyphenated one of Chinese Malaysian father, Anglo-Australian mother. He has a curious concern with belonging and identity. Tan grew up in Perth, Western Australia, a country with a brief but intense history of cultural displacement. Conversely, he felt awkward with Chinese groups, among which he felt more white. This ambivalence that accompanies cultural displacement in a space that is both accepting and stigmatizing simultaneously is engaged with in the arrival. Tan goes on to note that biculturalism is a binding theme as well as a good entry point to broader questions of existence that affect everybody. Migration is closely related to the contemporary history of Australia itself. The story tries a universal approach to the issue of migration and is representative of the specific construction of immigration as integral to an Australian identity. Sean Tan has said that he wanted his book to build a kind of empathy in readers. In Australia, 
people don't stop to imagine what it's like for some of these refugees. They just see them as a problem once they are here, without thinking about the bigger picture. I don't expect, he says, the book to change every makes them pause to think. I'll feel as if I've succeeded in something. Sean Tan asserts that the problem of belonging is a basic existential question where one has to consider and see as a general ontological condition whereby each of us is the migrant in that we all cross frontiers. In his view, the migrant sensibility is a burdensome freedom, has been one of loss as well as gain, not unlike Umi Bhabha, who considers the ambivalent process of splitting and hybridity that marks the identification with a culture's difference. Tan's illustrations in the book provide us the lens of the immigrant to whom the city appears strange, alienating, and even fantastical. Throughout the novel, Tan depicts a number of objects. Some are familiar, iconic images, such as a suitcase and a family photo. The colossal statue in the city harbor that greets the arrivals is reminiscent of the Statue of Liberty. These are juxtaposed with the strange and alienating objects the man encounters in the foreign country. Familiarizing himself with the alien food and objects, he furnishes his home with these strange objects alongside the familiar ones from his own homeland. This allows the protagonist to construct his immigrant being within the space of the host nation. I think I will condense this. The city assumes focus as a site of alienation as also of belonging, thereby com complicating the notion of the metropolis as, as home. In the end, the, the book closes with the migrant's family joining him. So the man is joined by his wife and child from his homeland. And the final image of the arrival has a child pointing in the distance at something beyond the periphery of the page. The scene is one of hope and utopia, resonating with the possibility of a bright future. So perhaps Rushdie's comment on Oz, one of the most famous and universal fairy tale utopias, is relevant here, since Rushdie the migrant sees in the Wizard of Oz a parable of the migrant condition. And I quote, so finally, Oz became home. The imagined world becomes the actual world, as it does for us all. Because the truth is that once we have left our childhood places and started out to make up our own lives, armed only with what we have and are, we understand that the real secret of the ruby slippers is not that there's no place like any place such as home, except, of course, the homes we make or the homes that are made for us in all which is anywhere and everywhere, except the place from which we began. Okay, if I have just one minute, I will quickly show you. This was the picture. Unfortunately, my presentation had all these visuals quite sharp, where the immigrant is entering the new land, and that statue is almost like the Statue of Liberty. Uh, Tan derives some inspiration from the image of New York there and the place that his homeland when he was leaving he gives his child an origami bird and that origami bird oh, connects with it becomes a bridge between the away and the homeland so thank you again I'm done. Looking forward to your questions. Thank you.
Hello. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Hello. Thank you. Uh, now the second presenter. Uh, actually, there will be a combined question and answer session after uh, after the presentation finished. All the presentation uh, will be finished. Then the combined question and answer will be there. Uh, so now the second presenter, uh, M. Aisarva. M. Aisarva, after graduating from JM uh, Autonomous College, Shambhalpur, with a first class distinction in English. He was post graduated from Sambalpur University. Uh, his first novel, The March Past Bride, was published by Pushtak Mahal, New Delhi in 2012. This was followed by uh, five novels. At present, he is a PhD scholar in English in the Department of Humanities with Surendra University of Technology, uh, Odisha. He has presented papers on neopaganism in several national and international conferences. And uh, two of these have been published in UGC Care Journals. Now, uh, the title of his paper is Belonging, Unbelonging, and the New Pagan Key. So, your time, uh, time starts now, just you present the paper. Uh, hello? Hello, am I audible? Hello. Hello. Huh, audible. Yeah, Hello, am, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. The voice is breaking. Okay. See, you are audible. You can let start. Let me you continue. Can start. Continue. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so uh, there is a technical problem. I think. Uh, I think he will uh, come back very soon. Uh, we'll wait. We'll wait for him. M. Isarva. Yes. Hello? Yes, yes. Hello? You are audible. Uh, hello? Uh, okay, good morning. Good morning, everyone. And I am going good to. I am, I am Ishwara from. And my paper is Belonging, Unbelonging, and the Neo Pagan Key. Things that we call our own or think to be our own are considered to be our belonging. But the idea of owning or considering something to be our own changes with time. If we look at the house, the children grow playing with each other. But as they grow, they begin to fight, and the house is broken. How does their own house turn into a yours and mine fight? It is the change of mentality. The fight between children breaks the house. Just imagine what happens when the feeling of belongingness is not found among the people of a country. There are many civilizations that abandoned their way of life and came under came into a, man, a, a monotheistic fold. Today, when the lost civilizations are being revived, the people in those countries are behaving as if they never belong to that area. If we look at India a thousand years ago, then the map was different. But then, all we all we know know the area that broke up from us linking itself to the central asians and boasts to have ruled over india though its citizens come to india for medical help when all its money gets used up for nurturing anti-india organizations this paper presents the examples of two civilizations namely greece and india to show how things that have been acquired by them are being abandoned and how new paganism serves as a key for them to recover what is lost in the year 2007 a lady who was a former executive in advertising sang the horrific, hy horrific hymns. A group of pagans with her went about the co Corinthian column singing the hymns. Ten days later, the Orthodox Church cat categorized them as uh, to be a satanic cult. One has to wonder how, how this glorious civilization ended up this way and why it is objectionable for certain organizations, organizations to worship the Greek gods in Greece. The Greeks have not gone anywhere. They are in Greece only. Then why is it offensive if anyone worships the deities that, uh, that their ancestors worshipped? Why do they look at the worship of the, of the ancient gods as if they never belong to them? If one looks deep and thinks about it, then one can get, get that the Greeks are cut off from the roots due to the Abrahamic monotheistic indoctrination that makes them follow a religion that never belong to them. We can get a hint of it of how it began from the list of dates given in the website rasias.gr, which is a Greek neopagan website. 
in the year 314 ad after the church got legality it began to attack the non abrahamic community the worship the worship of artemis was banned the year 324 ad constantine made christianity the official religion of rome the result was the oracles of apollo were tortured to death and the local hellenic temples were destroyed year 326 ad constantine ordered the destruction of the temple of of the god Asclepius of Cilicia and other temples like the goddess of Aphrodite which was there in Jerusalem in the year 330 AD Constantine stole the wealth from pagan temples in 335 AD he executed the pagans of Asia Minor in 341 AD emperor Constans the son of Constantinus either imprisoned or killed a number of pagans in the year 346 AD Constantinople witnessed a large a large scale killing of pagans In 353 AD, death penalty was imposed on anyone who worshipped the gods of their ancestors. In 354 AD, Constantinus ordered closing of pagan temples. Some temples were turned into brothels. Pagan priests were killed. The libraries were burned. When we read uh, read the above, it becomes obvious how a systematic attack was made as a result. The result of which the current generation of Greeks do not have the knowledge of of their ancestors. The old faith was routed. the old go- the old gods were turned into evil being the extent of hate to one's roots can be seen when we learn from the book encyclopedia of new paganism where it is mentioned how the greek orthodox church is against the new pagan a new pagan group called the greek society of the attic friends has been denied recognition to be to be a legal religion in greece the group claims to to be having about 40000 members but it is still denied a recognition in their own country the most interesting interesting thing is they are even denied to build a temple in athens which was the capital of ancient greece the place is named after the god of the goddess goddess athena who is the goddess of courage and wisdom today those who are trying to revive the old faith cannot even build a temple this just shows the amount of unbelongingness that has accumulated in the minds of the people in authority the indian subcontinent can be taken as a living example of, example of how what once belonged to it has lost its belongingness let us begin with afghanistan a thousand years ago the people of afghanistan built the buddha statue in bamiyan the giant towering structure in their 2001 it was again the same afghans who destroyed it the people were the same but something had changed the statues which are a part of the glorious heritage of their land did not belong to that part anymore from baba to aurangzeb all had attacked it but it was the taliban that finally demolished it the statue had belonged to the ancestors of that region now it did not belong to it after the taliban rule was gone today it is being reconstructed the importance of a thing is felt only if, only after it is gone afghanistan was once a glorious civilization today it is a war torn country that is dead and never going to recover as all those things that belong to the ancestors have been abandoned Pakistan is another example the kings like Porus and Raja Dahir and many such exemplary kings of that region of India are never taught in the history books of that country you will never find even a road named after the warriors who were born there the partition was more like people killing each other even if they were born in the same land the temples like Kapsraj and many more which used to glorify that region were abandoned technically these temples were built many thousand years ago by the people of that area but with time it was the mentality of the people that changed and they began to kill themselves the temple were broken as expected the heritage of the ancestors appeared as if they didn't belong to them things that could have turned these monuments into tourist places have now been devastated and so as the countries one is already a devastated civilization the other is gradually heading to anarchy now if we look uh, uh, if we compare this to egypt egypt then we can find an exception Egyptian turned the pyramid into a tourist monument and it is flourishing in new paganism new paganism is a movement where the faith that were damaged by the abrahamic monotheist cults are being revived according to the book the birth of new paganism there are new pagan movements all over europe in countries like the united kingdom ireland scandinavia and germany in order to know how things work we have to read books that revive interest in the ancient culture the books of amitra party tripathi create interest in the various locations where the civilization of bharat existed in the book in the book the immortals of meluha he talks about the saptasindhu karachapa 
Lothal and also Mohenjo-daro. Sub Sindhu is told to be the place where the civilization of India is believed to have been born. Creating interest in this is an attempt to revive the longing towards those places. In the book Pagan Portal, Aphrodite encountering the goddess of love and beauty and initiation, the author even mentions how the festivals are being revived. Like Aphrodite, Aphrodite is was a festival dedicated to goddess Aphrodite. It was it is belongs to the cult of Aphrodite, but with time it had got lost. But the current Greek neo pagans have revived it. Beforehand they used to uh, they used to give uh, sacrifice of dogs over there, but this time they only give incense sticks. The neo pagan movement is polytheist in nature, and this also helps things like respecting other cultures because in the classical age there were various civilizations that did coexist. Neo paganism is just a revival movement where interest is being. aroused in reviving things of value that belong to the past but now have suffered unbelongingness if it went on in india a lot of conflicts would have would have been dispersed because polytheism can create a feeling of mutual living among the people thank you thank you uh, thank you m sarva uh, for the beautiful presentation thank you for the beautiful presentation now uh, the third presenter uh, shanjana srivastava srivastava she is an ma in english from st paul's cathedral uh, mission college university of calcutta she aspires to research or mas on masculinity studies uh, in future the title of her paper is language as a center of being a textual mystic so i would like to uh, request shanjana srivastava to uh, begin her presentation good morning everyone uh, thank you for this opportunity and the topic of my paper is language as a center of being a textual mystic the study of english has more often been a this the semiotic evolution of english as an affluent academic subject in 19th century britain was confirmed by its inclusion in oxford and cambridge universities the linguistic emergence of english as a confirmatory discipline uh, got reaffirmed uh, in the 1921 newbold report many writers educated under colo colonial uh, colonialization uh, sorry colon colonization recount how uh, demoted or humiliated for speaking their native language in uh, uh, in colonial schools the era that witnessed the blossoming of english as discourse at the same time led to colonial imperialism the historical genealogy shows that the study of english and the growth of empire was central in its linguistic flow it proceeded from one particular ideological center as a propagandist motive constructing an idea of civility and humanity which diametric savagery brutalization uh, barbarism demoralization and brutality as its antithetical theater Therefore, the natives aspired to imitate the center with an urge of being accepted, adopted, and eventually absorbed. In order to become more English than the English, the margins immersed themselves in the import, denying their sources of origin. The canonical nature of English literary tra uh, traditions and values remained powerful in the. Interestingly, a large part of literature that that the 19th century witnessed was produced by Anglicised Indian elites or uh, African missionary literates, such as Mofolo's Chaka. Uh, such works depicted permanent or temporary transformation from literate to being uh, from illiterate to being literate. Uh, mastery in the language of elites endorsed a privileged class uh, endowed with merit and leisure that formed the prerequisites of such works. when uh, raja ramon roy writes uh, the precepts of jesus the guide to peace and happiness its textual germination is definitely not without the influence of imperial elitism it has always been uh, written and framed by the conquerors and not the conquered uh, foucault explains that the primary beat of any shape or form remains under the direct control of the apparatus who exercises power over the justifiable form censorship and the modes of publication so any literary produced gets textual validity only by passing through the centralized discourses of acceptability that expurgates limits and sanitizes the of being uh, of a different uh, outlook 
does the abrogation of this uh, constraining power and appropriation of language and the right uh, form the foundation of the development of independence uh, literature. Postcolonial writers go through a linguistic carnival to castrate the Eurocentric English. Such a linguistic decolonization follows two specific procedures, abrogation and appropriation. Abrogation rejects the privileges attached to Britain, uh, Britain the uh, metropolitan power over the means of communication. It also refuses the imperial uh, culture, its aesthetic and its illusory standard of abrogation deconstructs the Western obsession with linguistic accuracy. For instance, uh, copula marking uh, and negation are prominent features of also Kamala Das's poem introduction rinses off. Uh, rinses of the assumptions attached to uh, standard English, reflecting the absurdness of postcolonial dilemma. Uh, like she writes, uh, why not let me speak in any language I like? The language I speak becomes mine. It's just awareness. All mine, mine alone. It is half English, half Indian, funny perhaps, but it is honest. It is as human as I am human, don't you see? We can see how Das uh, paints a painstaking tension of linguistic wish. The second term, thus, uh, the, uh, the second term, sorry, the second term appropriation in the strategies of utilizing the philosophical, linguistic, and academic agendas of the center to reconstruct its own versions of realization, construct the colonizers. Uh, in Raja Rao's work, uh, uh, in Raja Rao's words, appropriation is uh, is to convey in a language that is not one's own the spirit that is one's own. For instance, while Achibe uses the colonizer's language to distribute the African tales, such practice is, on the other hand, contested by Ngugi or uh, Chinveju, who promote the usage of uh, native cultural dialects and vocabularies. English in Africa and Africa was a cultural bomb that continued the process of erasing pre-colonial linguistic memories. The cross-lingual nature of post-colonial society constantly negotiates the fractured intersection between two worlds, self and the anti-self. Post-colonial literature is always written out of the tension between abrogation of the received English, uh, which speaks from the center, and appropriation and the and the act of appropriation which brings standard english under the influence of vernacular speech habits and local language however the variants of english uh, language are often discarded like impurities uh, for instance in campbell policy and passion a character says that to be colonial is is to uh, is to talk australian slang to be everything that is abominable language becomes the systematic power that perpetuates the hierarchical framework. A sound operative self is crumbled by the pain of linguistic uh, dislocation. Semantic alienation occurs due to conscious or unconscious oppression of indigenous tongue by the aspiration of apparently superior models. This disjunction uh, that is situated between the experience of place and the language available to describe it forms a universal monochromatic disorder of the postcolonial texts. Uh, therefore, Indian like Raja Rao and Nigerian writer like Achibe metamorphose the language to establish its distinct usage in a new archaeological context. Rao and Achibe undergo textual in overcoming an imposed gap as a consequence of linguistic displacement of the pre-colonial language by English. Uh, in a situation of diglossia and bilingualism, there is always an unconscious interference of the mother tongue in any individual's actualization of second language. This interference is of a syntactic level where the structure of the second language is influenced by the mother tongue of any bilingual writer. Most postcolonial authors manifest a, a clear example of unconscious interference of mother tongue in standard English, while many dis, uh, demonstrate a conscious effort to represent such uh, interference. Gabriel Okan, for instance, uh, depicts a linguistic problem that confronts the African writers. Okara says that if one wants to express the African imagination, one cannot put aside the African language in favor of English. He rather tries to adapt European language to African reality. Okara almost tries to literally translate Ijo, his native language, the novel The Voice. Okara lets the Ijo tongue speak in, his, uh, in English. Uh, he writes, shuffling feet turn it to the door. He saw three men standing silent, opening not their mouths. 
who are you people be okolo asked the people opens not there if you are coming in people be then come in in deconstructing the syntax of english okara seeks to free african text from the foreign domination so raja rao kanthapura we find kannad syntactic uh, uh, structure he tries by means of uh, sentence structures to reproduce kannad language uh, in english for instance he writes uh, high on the ghats is it high up the steep mountains that face the cool arabian seas up the malabar coast is it up mangalore and puttur and many a center of cardamom and and coffee rice and sugar cane rao suggests that the indian writer in english should learn english and not babu english uh, that is the english uh, of oxford and cambridge educated in, uh, englishmen expression of native sensibility in english, uh, is a challenge that every post colonial writer face it is actually realistically impossible and textually unachievable to recover absolute pre colonial parity nor is it viable uh, to create a separatist national or regional enterprise rather the amalgamation of ethical worlds within leads to a unique uh, acquisition of a third space this making of uh, new english becomes a therapeutic act of resonance reshaping a colonial language to uh, uh, to reflect the post colonial experience hence it has been a constant literary engineering of the post colonial new english to destabilize standard english post colonial writers reconstructed and metamorphosed english put away standardized english uh, and and uh, it deflected linguistic uh, truths Uh, the fusion of linguistic root that is the native language uh, with linguistic rootlessness caused by the canonical language linguistic root r o u t e and and with this realization as derida says writing then returns to being what it should never have been, an accessory an accident and an excess thank you thank you uh thank you shandana uh, for uh, your beautiful presentation uh now uh, the last presenter of this uh, session of this technical session uh ishita sarkar uh, ishita i would like to request uh, to present your paper so ishita yes. sarkar is a phd research scholar in the department of english jadavpur university the title of her paper is re establishing home and restoring repressed voices in ramabai espinets the swinging bridge so uh, request uh, isita sharkar uh, to start her presentation thank you sir thank you uh, a very good morning to all of you and i'm here to present my paper which is titled reestablishing home and restoring repressed voices in ramabai espinets novel the swinging bridge so i'll start my presentation by diving right into the important section of my paper which starts with a few pressing questions which are as follows how to convey a story that has not been told how to narrate a history that has not been written how to sing songs that one has not heard and how to know where to go when you do not know where you are coming from these are the questions that trouble mona the protagonist of ramabai espinets debut novel the swinging bridge published in 2003 In this novel, the Indo-Trinidadian author Ramabai Espinet explores themes concerning the quest of identity and self-recovery, followed by the quest of se- uh, followed by the quest of re-establishing home. The central character and narrator Mona Singh, an Indo-Trinidadian living in Montreal, Canada, confronts a variety of family secrets and untold stories about her ancestry that were revealed to her during a series of trips to and from Trinidad. So what was initially a private exploration later becomes a recapturing and recovering of our family's Trinidadian history as well as a review of Mona's Indian heritage carrying the reader through a journey in time and space in fact the novel explores 19th century india and trinidad as well as the canadian and trinidadian societies of the 1990s the narrative moves back and forth between montreal and trinidad and it is within this narrative structure that mona unearths many untold stories in her family and ancestral history these untold stories concern the silenced and buried histories of her indian great grandmother named gainder whose story illuminate the broader social historical experience of indian indentureship in trinidad uh, 
Now, this particular novel, The Swinging Beach, is primarily about its protagonist, Mona Singh, undertaking a journey in order to discover and make a sense of her Indian identity and to embrace the hold that her Indian past will have on her. However, initially, not having a solid sense of her identity, Mona often referred to herself as a quote-unquote novarian. Now, a novarian can have a variety of different meanings, and it is a common expression used in Trinidad to describe someone who seems to fit nowhere. As Espinette, the novel's author, points out that the word is, and I quote, used both disparagingly and sort of defaintly, unquote. She continues to explain that Mona uses this term for herself and identifies with this term because, I quote, she doesn't feel at home in any particular place or in any particular setting. She is a misfit, unquote. So evidently, Mona is just getting by in the host country, which is Canada, and uh, where she is a resident and where her Indo Trinidadian family has migrated from Trinidad in the hope for a better life and of a promising future and prosperity and success. However, it did not take long for the Singh family to come to the understanding that they did not fit in Canada, that they do not fit in Canada. Also, Mona sees racism, which is making it impossible for her to settle in Canada and call it a place of her own. While other European immigrants, represented by her own Scottish boyfriend Roddy, seem easily to, I quote, find and invent, unquote, homes. And is unwilling to, quote unquote, invent home for herself, reveals her high level of disconnection from any sense of home at the very outset of this novel. This sense of nowhereness, dislocation, and cultural uneasiness also appeared, also appeared as a gendered issue. As a female character, Mona represents another fragment of the Indo Trinidadian community confronted with the issue of belonging. Through the character of Mona, the novel addresses the female Indo Trinidadian contemporary dilemma. Indian heritage. To further complicate matters, this either or situation, this either or binary, cultural binary is represented for those such as Mona who live in the diaspora as a choice between Trinidad and Canada. Now, it is uh, the final request of Mona's dying brother to buy back the family estate in Trinidad that triggers the action in the novel, which initiates Mona's task of going to Trinidad. Realizing her brother's desire to reclaim this land is also a wish to ensure and to reestablish connection to their family and cultural history. Mona begins to seriously consider this request. At first reluctant, Mona's heart eventually softens when she and her brother reflect upon their grandparents' early struggles to procure the land on the so-called Manahamre Road. At this point, Mona explains, and I quote, having agreed to go to Trinidad, I found myself eager to see the land again, to finalize the deal. Now that I understood my brother's stake, I wanted to complete the reposition before it was too late." Unquote. So Mona's enthusiasm for quote unquote repossessing the land parallels her later desire to repossess her family's secret in order for her to truly begin to know herself. Back in Trinidad, Mona's explorations came across a book about her family's history. Here, Mona noticed that the history has largely bypassed one prominent female member of the family, which is, of course, Gainder, Mona's great-grandmother. Quite shockingly, it is only at the very end of the final page of this book that Mona finds only three sentence information of Gainder and nothing else. This brief account of Gainder's life reads, I quote, Lily's mother was named Gainder. She came from India in the 19th century. She died in childbirth. And that's it. After further investigation, Mona came to know that it is her grandfather who had torn the pages out of that book of their family history in an attempt to silence and keep secret the evidence of Gainder's life. Disappointed, Mona realizes that the reason why Gainder's story is unknown to most of her family members is deliberate. Her grandfather's act of reading the 
that the book demonstrates intentional male dominance as it became clear to mona that this very act is perpetrated in order to preserve the male ethical discourse that presents the indian migration to trinidad exclusively as a family process rather than to espouse the truth that it is also in fact a journey of the thousands of independent indian female indentured laborers the silences and the deliberate and selective erasure are thus reason enough for mona to recover the hidden histories of her female ancestors in order to achieve a better idea of her own lineage it became the answer to why mona must repossess the ancestral land both literally and figuratively what mona first learns is not about her great grandmother's personality her no longer sang after she got married from her mother mona came to know that her mother had heard about that infamous about those infamous songs that gainder was forbidden to sing after her marriage mainly because those songs were regarded as the rand's songs now the word rand had the hindi connotation it had the hindi connotation of prostitute it was on her second trip to trinidad that mona eventually stumbles upon a box a box that contained lily's old shop books lily stumbles upon a box that contains lily's old shop books and learns that this records her shopping lists and cooking recipes double as diaries and personal accounts in those diaries mona finds clues and i quote by combining grandma lily's jottings in several of her books i was able to piece together the story of my great grandmother unquote later the same shop books reveal the meaning of gainder's hindi songs now describing gainder's story and songs as i quote a story waiting to be told my own story unquote mona goes on to discover the meaning of these songs which was originally sung in hindi the as part of mona's research consists of translating the rand's songs which her own great grandmother used to sing from hindi to english this very act gives mona the access to an indian female memory otherwise excluded by male so uh, there is a technical problem i think uh, we'll come back soon uh, she is now presenting uh, her paper uh, so uh, we have to wait 2 uh, 3 minutes uh, or few minutes we have to wait i think uh, she will come back very soon so you have the limitations the technical problems will be there mm. so we'll wait uh, one or two minutes uh, then we'll come back uh, for the interactive session uh.
show of uh, the network issue is there. Uh, see, is, is it back on the stream? No. Um, am I audible, yes, sir? Yes, yes, you are perfectly audible. Just you uh, finished your paper, a presentation. Hello? Yes, yes, you are audible. You are audible. Is it okay, We can uh, hear you. Shall I resume? Uh, shall I yes, resume? Yes, yes, yes you, you resume. You start. Okay. Uh, can you tell me, uh, like, uh, how much time I le I'm left with? Just, just complete your paper. Uh, two, three minutes left. Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, uh, this particular uh, paper is mainly about how Mona and Indo Trinidadian, how she is uh, trying to reconnect with her ancestral past by uncovering the many secrets that her great grandmother um, had had you know uh, brought with her during her journey from India to Trinidad as an endangered labor. Now, uh, after getting hold of Gainda's songs, Mona has tried to find the meanings of those songs, and uh, and she came up with some interesting and. Um, and 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 some powerful uh, assertions that the song kind of uh, espouse the meanings of the songs kind of espouse so uh, you know after deciphering the meaning that were conveyed by those songs uh, those meanings constitute a major tension in the plot and and it's crucial to understand the reason why men forbade women to sing them in the first place the songs appeared as archives containing knowledge about the migration of independent Indian women who resisted male domination during the journey to Trinidad across the Kalapani. If Mona is to have a complete picture of her ancestral past, it is important, um, this important piece of history about the independent Indian female indentured laborers needs to be reconnected with other historical accounts of the Indian arrival in the Caribbean. Now, the novelist drama by Espinel's deployment of Gainder's songs challenges the notion and the idealized picture of the righteous Indian family coming across the Kalapani together, just like the way migration is presented to them. And not just, and, and, and uh, so, so this is how drama by Espinel is challenging this notion this notion of uh, the whole enterprise of migration of the indentured laborers. Espinel's characterization of Gainder is her artistic refutation of these stereotypes. Her focus on the ways in which Gainder's spirit is transmitted and how it is passed down to generations of women reveal the interconnectedness of secrecy and self-recovery. Had Gainder not brought songs from India that carried secrets in them and had her daughter Lily not ensured their, ensured their safety, Mona wouldn't have had the opportunity to unlock the secrets and in doing so, begin her own personal process of self-renewal. Consequently, Mona's quest for information about her great-grandmother Gainder results in the reconstruction of the Rand as an independent woman figure. The transference of memories that reveal the Rand's experiences as well as the woman resisting male judgment contributes to this reconstruction. Now, finally, in conclusion, it can be said that both Mona and Gainder travel to the con they both of them travel to the Caribbean on their own journey of self-discovery. The two women's journeys of uh, sorry, the two women's journeys to Trinidad intersect, enabling Mona to meet Gainder and confront her own sense of otherness and reconcile herself to it in order to carry on with her life in Canada. She develops the idea for a film about her great grandmother's life, thus infusing her own drifting, nowhereian existence with a new purpose as an artist, as her great grandmother used to be. So the evidence of the strong presence of Gainder's inspiring story provides her great granddaughter with a point of access to her invisible history. In the course of the novel, the uncovering of the lost voices and the consequent restoring of the same inspires Mona to dig deep into her roots, which then led to her self-discovery and self-recovery. Unlocking these secrets enabled Mona to return to her final home, Montreal, self-assured, secured, rejuvenated, and renewed. Therefore, this paper has attempted to focus on how Mona's experience as a first-generation immigrant demonstrate the seeming paradox between nostalgia for a lost home and the desire to make a home in the new diasporic community. The novel also comprises a powerful gendered analysis and a nuanced representation of women of Indian descent in both historical and contemporary settings. Espinet, the novel's author, adamantly 
rejects stereotypical constructions of women sorry of indian womanhood in history as well as in her literature and opens up a space for more multifaceted characterizations in creating complex indian descent female characters espinet ascribes agency to a category of women often seen as invisible thus espinet has made clear her long standing concerns with the erasure of indo caribbean rather indo trinidadian women in the literature culture and politics of the region this particular novel the swinging bridge speak this particular novel the swinging bridge seeks to rectify that same erasure by thank you thank you thank you uh, thank you ishita yes thank you sir uh, thank you so uh, now uh, the time for uh, interactive sessions uh, so uh, for the interactive sessions i welcome again uh, dr pritesh chakraborty the chairperson uh, chair uh, who chairs the session uh, just I, I would like to uh, request you, sir, to ask the questions if you have, and uh, if you have any observations or comments, you can share with us. So uh, please, uh, you can start now. Okay. Um, I hope uh, I am audible, and yes, I'm, yes, I'm sure I'm sure uh, other people are audible as well. <clears throat> But I would request uh, each one of you to mute your mic. so that uh, the, there is less interference and unmute yourself only when you are addressed yeah, so in that way it will help us to uh, yeah communicate better thanks okay <clears throat> so it was a wonderful uh, uh, discussion uh, based on the theme and uh, of course uh, near to my heart is um, tans uh, graphic uh, format but i also liked uh, uh, everyone else's uh, presentations uh, they, they were linguistic they were based on uh, religious even on texts the uh, the last one um my observations uh, i will share uh, one by one uh, with the presenters uh, the first that i uh, I, i would like to share uh, it's not a question it's it's rather an observation uh, about uh, uh, dr rocha's uh, presentation um do you do you think uh, dr rocha that uh, the fact that the entire narrative is devoid of any um narrative piece uh, the entire uh, entire comic book entire graphic novel did not have any typed or written words did it take away uh, something uh, or did it rather add to the to the to the nuanced uh, uh, silence that you said very correctly uh, into the graphic uh, format into the into the narrative of the story what do you think what is your take on that so i think that this is a and i have spent time thinking about this as well i think like shawn himself like shawn tan says when he starts out he says we are so dependent on words and silence is such an important part of life and i think he tries to do something very different in capturing that and in showing you how things it it's almost like this is reflective of the trans nationalism and this morning my my 9 year old son was going through this book because it was on the table and he says what what a terrible book this what happened to the words and um, i thought about how that reinforced how dependent we are on language on and on words and when i started reading it i was also lost a few things are definitely very defamiliarized for instance the book starts with these pictures like a passport photo is so well the passport photos of people from different different nationalities and he defamiliarizes everything you see the the book looks it has it's got this photo album old kind of jaded feel to it and it's all in grayscale and monochrome and uh, that was perfect the cue that you had about how color the black and white and what even but he makes 
these images speak so in such a nuanced manner and so eloquently and i think to answer your question i think i would rather have this book without the words i think the silence is very very loud in the book Uh, uh my idea as well because there are uh, comic books and there are graphic narratives without words and they are equally effective and i believe uh tan is making a statement by saying that um uh, he solves the the problem of the language when one community and another uh, uh, community tries to cross borders uh, go into kind of a, a transnational space Uh, then uh, the, the the need of language can be solved by the language of compassion which is usually silent that's a very good take that you uh, had on that dr rose brilliant really um uh, is is anybody uh, yeah i mean uh, okay so now uh, i would uh, go to uh, ashwarya yeah that was a really a very uh, nice presentation that you uh, made uh, about this neo paganism and uh, how uh, it has been resisted and how uh, the discourse of uh, the 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 pagan discourse have been um, kind of sidelined and marginalized um i think uh, uh, the, the one of the answers to this kind of a conundrum uh, is uh, the fact that do you think uh, would you believe or would you agree with me when i say that um the forms of the pagan uh, uh, rituals as you pointed out in terms of greece or even in india i mean uh, i i'm a i'm a so called uh, hindu uh, and I, i'm a so called brahmin but i hardly um uh, study or i hardly know uh, uh, the details about my own culture and my own identity as being a hindu or or being a being a brahmin or being whatever uh, religious or cultural uh, uh, roots i have uh, would you agree that uh, while we are um, assimilating i would use the word assimilating would you agree that while we are assimilating a new culture a, a westernized culture maybe if you uh, want to say that we are formulating we are formatting we are creating new roots rather than just uh uh losing our own and floating in the air are we creating something new what is your take on that uh, actually sorry your question was very long in between i lost it actually the oh. question was very long <laughs> okay i'm sorry i'll 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 uh, i'll make it short do you think that the loss of the identity is something to be lamented yes, or should we assimilate the new elements that are coming in from anywhere and celebrate it uh, okay sir actually about this new paganism thing actually sir it's just like uh, let's take it many years ago the dinosaurs were there then they are they became extinct then uh, right now it is being said that their cells are they are trying to find out and revive them so it is just uh, like like that means something all of a sudden happened and a big civilizations men uh, like greek rome roman they were uh, what happened they just got wiped out people somehow managed means they kept it alive and because of the age of internet now they are coming to focus or else the greek faith had not been extinct it had just lost its highlights sir so when we come to the indian context here of course yes if we say that we are the only civilization that survived time and uh, hopefully we will survive the test of time so here the on, only revival things that can be done is like our barriers that have been created those are those can be wiped out for example let's take it uh, the caste issue that, that uh, we are saying we are actually trying to use the new pagan methods to wipe it out means which we say before and we had the varna system we are reviving it in in a manner and of course in uh, we as it is uh, as we are a big civilization it and it is a worth preserving civilization it needs to be revived sir i agree uh, with uh, with that yes uh, but i would also add that um, uh, we should welcome new currents so that uh, the old systems uh, get uh, refreshed and revived uh, while uh, accepting the new ones i mean we can agree to disagree but 
that's what i that's what my take is on your uh, paper thank you so much um now uh, going to uh, uh, sanjana srivastava uh, this point your presentation uh, opened up a new uh, aspect of this discussion which which uh, dr rocha and i tried to touch upon but uh, you were very um, uh, pointed in 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 presenting uh, the aspect my idea my my uh, my question uh, to you would be um when one uh, uh, community when one group of people crosses over to a new uh, territory to a new culture um how important uh, do you think uh, it is for the individual especially to mold himself or herself into the new linguistic habits does that help i mean i'm asking this question from the perspective of all those people who are uh, moving towards say uh, uh, to, to to new cultures like some people who are going to uh, for a scholarship in different uh, universities i think this question is pertinent for them what is your take on that it is actually impossible to get rid of uh, our past cultures and it is also impossible to welcome the new culture totally forgetting the past culture so it is always the amal of the new and the old which will lead to something uh, uh something new again uh we cannot just uh, uh forget the old ones and uh, we should uh, we we can or uh, it will be easier for us if we amalgamate both to to discover a new route yes true uh, um, just like again uh, my own discourse comics yeah I, i i agree i mean there should be an amalgamation and uh, uh, there is no harm in uh, standing out either uh, with a thick bengali or a thick uh, indian accent in the in the in the uh, in the west thank you uh, so much uh, for uh, the clarification uh, now uh, on to uh, ishita shorkar i am not familiar uh, with the with the novel but uh, i do believe that um, the, the the very uh, the use of this um, word and, and you are breaking up in between but i i think i i don't know if i'm i got the word correct the word rand uh is is uh was a word of um abuse a word of uh, derogation the derogation but uh it has been used in in a kind of a defense just as once upon a time uh, the, the word niga or negro uh, was a bad was was a word of insult but now the people have appropriated it to to uh, signify their own um, subculture which i think is um, something that you are trying to point out uh that's great i don't have any uh questions uh for you but i would really applaud uh your presentation of of uh, the marginalized um, gender and the marginalized uh, occupation thank you so much uh, for that it's over to you uh, sir uh, for your closing comments and uh, formalities thank you thank you sir for your insightful comment uh sir you are mute uh, kindly unmute yourself yeah so sure. uh th thanks to all uh, and uh, we are at the very end of this technical session uh so uh, now the time for uh, thanksgiving uh, i i express my heartfelt gratitude to dr prithish chakraborty uh, who has given uh, his valuable time uh, for us and uh, for delivering the beautiful lecture the insightful lecture uh, so uh, thanks to uh, thanks to uh, dr prithish chakraborty so uh, thanks to our uh, paper presenters uh, and at last uh, thanks to the, to my students and the audiences uh, who have participated in great number uh, i think uh, this is not the last session we will come back uh, in, the, in, the, in the in the last session we will we will start Uh, at 5 uh, pm uh, today so uh, i would like to request to attend uh, the last session 
the last technical session of this two-day international seminar. Uh, so uh, at last, so uh, I would like to again uh, express my heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Pritesh Chakraborty for giving us your valuable time. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You. So thank that's you. all for 